Welcome to Mind Over Matter, where we feature young Jamaicans who are shooting for the stars. I'm your host, Margaret Boyne. He's only 17 years old, but he lives an action-packed life as a race car driver. He's the youngest driver to compete at Dover Raceway. He's currently leading in the MP2 Championship. He shares his story of life being fast and furious. My guest is Tommy Gore. Welcome to Mind Over Matter, Tommy. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this, man. You're, you're my first guest from the motorsport um, fraternity. That's great. I hope, I hope to get some more people here with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I look forward to that. Um, you're 17 years old, but you have been racing for several years. Um, how long have you been racing or how long have you been driving? So I started driving when I was actually three years old. I got this rally go-kart type of thing. And from then, I could anything I could get my hands on, I would want to drive it. And my, my dad's pick up <laughs> anything, literally anything in the house. And then when I was five years old, I made my way out to Palisades go-kart track for my fifth birthday. And I tried out the go-karts out there. And from then, I've just loved it. The bug bit me and it's been 12 and a half years since. And I, I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. <laughs> But um, you're from a, a family of uh, race car drivers. Um, your father is Douglas Gore and your grandfather is Neil Gore. So was there any pressure from your family or friends, you know, for you to follow on the same path? I mean, back then, it, it, I mean, it didn't really resonate with me. Obviously, I knew my dad raced and mm-hmm. my grandpa raced because that's how I grew up. From I was zero, literally, I was at rallies just watching in the back of my mom's car and was going to every Dover that I could but I mean I didn't feel any pressure I didn't feel pressured back then I didn't feel pressured by the family to start racing or to get into racing or be successful in racing mm-hmm. but I think back then it was definitely just about the love for the sport obviously now you have people coming up to you and saying oh you don't go son this and this and this and <laughs> right. you must win and, but that's that's all a part of it and that's fun for me and I, I love seeing that I love seeing the fans come and interact with me but okay. definitely no pressure from the family side right now this going out there and having fun. Okay. So as a child, as you mentioned, you would always be going at the track with your father? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what about your mother? Was she supportive of this? Because, I mean, I would go <laughs> crazy, you know? <laughs> I mean, she. I have to say she was very supportive of, of me throughout the years. But really? I'd say that her nerves on a different level, I mean, especially when I was younger, she never, she wasn't able to watch a race. Not that she didn't want to, she wasn't <laughs> able to watch a race. It's just until recently that she started to watch. And even then, like, I come in and she's, like, hugging me up tight, tight, tight. <laughs> Yes. The support is there from her for sure, but I know her nerves sometimes get the best of her, or she has to battle them down. Yes. Every once in a while. <laughs> um, you mentioned go kart racing. Um, tell us about that experience. Tell us about that whole time when you were a um, go kart racer. So I raced carts for 11 years, and I mean, I drove cars for the last two or three years now. But I raced go-karts for 11 years properly, going out there at least, especially when I was younger, going out there every probably two weeks, every week, especially just to learn. It teaches me, it taught me a lot about the the dynamics of racing, the race craft, the, the, the basics that is, it's extremely hard to teach someone when they're older. You can't teach them those fundamentals that you, you absorb the information so much better when you're younger. Mm. And I feel karting is a, the bare bones foundation for any racing driver, any successful racing driver, at least. I mean, in Jamaica, the Caribbean and worldwide, I mean, we have people in Formula One, which is a pinnacle currently. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. almost all of them, I think all of them actually have had their roots in karting. Not one of them started when they were 25 and just made their way in. It was a long, long, long process of many years, many Mm -hmm. tireless years to get to the point that they're at. Mm-hmm. But I feel for me that that experience, and especially with the coaches that I had, Colin Daly and Peter Moody Senior, they really embedded in me. And Peter Ray, who just retired from GRDC from circuit racing as well, after I think it was over fifty years, mm-hmm. and those those guys embedded in me the the discipline that you need and the determination that you need to fight with every time you go out on the track. And I think it it also transferred from 
my racing life and social life to my school life, actually, especially with the discipline and the determination to do my best every time, mm -hmm. every test. Mm -hmm. So, so for sure, I'd say... <clears throat> yeah, go you represented Jamaica um, in go-kart? Yes, I did. I, I, I think I am the only Jamaican to win in both Guyana and Barbados. Okay. In, in carts. Obviously, people have done it in cars, but I don't think anyone else has done it in go-karts, mm -hmm. to my knowledge. But Guyana and Barbados, and I've also raced in Florida a couple of times, representing Jamaica. Okay. Um, you mentioned something about a circuit driver. So you're both a circuit driver and a rally driver? Yes. Um, so oh, circuit, okay. circuit and rally are, you say you have three real disciplines of motorsport, or four, sorry. You have circuit rally drift and drag mm -hmm. and circuit and rally are my two main disciplines or genres that, that you'd say circuit is more of a a continuous point you start at the same point and you end at the same point and you do continuous laps usually at about eight to ten mm -hmm. or six to ten it depends on the car and the race itself or they can go longer up to probably like 70 laps in some mm -hmm. cases internationally but locally, we do six to 10 laps around over Raceway. And it's a consecutive race. And you have about 10 people in the same race as you, in the same class and same race as you. So it's very exciting. And you get that wheel-to-wheel -wheel action. And you see all the, the different little intricacies coming out between each driver. When one makes a mistake, the other one is pouncing on it right there. Mm -hmm. But rally com is a completely different genre, I'd say. You can't be a a good circuit driver and jump into rally and be amazing immediately mm -hmm. because rally is a point-to-point a -point race it's you start where you're starting is not where you're finishing most most mm -hmm. of the time mm -hmm. usually about five to ten kilometers is a stage locally and internationally they can go up to 20 25 kilometers straight and you have about 10 probably 10 stages per day and usually it's a two-day rally so you're you're running hundreds of kilometers out there so it's definitely a a race of attrition compared to mm -hmm. circuit racing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it requires a different level of focus throughout the day to be on your marks every time especially on the competition side to be on your marks every time go out there doing your best but also saving the car not pushing it to the exact limit whereas circuit is more get it right every every lap every time mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and get it mm -hmm. to the limit to be able to pull away from your competition whereas rally you only you only need it just before the limit to be able to out to best your competition okay so so what is your training program like though tommy <laughs> tell I me mean, all about that <laughs> so when i was younger it was really go and drive almost every week i'd go at least once a week to the go-kart track to practice and develop and obviously back then you, you don't know nearly as much as you do now so go out every corner just work on every single corner on the track every like maybe every session i'd work on two corners and once you perfect the track out there, the Palisados go-kart track is actually an internationally recognized track, one of the best in the world. Mm -hmm. So once you can master that track, literally you can go anywhere else in the world and you'll, you'll book up a corner that's familiar and you'll be able to master it as well. Mm -hmm. But as I got older, you master that track and you move up, as you move up in the classes, so you usually every two to three years, you move up a go-kart class and usually that, results in a, a bigger chassis and a faster engine. So that's something else that you have to adapt to and get used to throughout the year. Mm -hmm. But as you get older, you also need to get stronger physically to manage those bigger carts and to be able to compete with those older guys. So currently, especially in the last four or so years, I've been doing a lot more endurance training, more running to get my stamina up, especially when I'm in the car. It's, it's over 100 and probably 10, 15 degrees in there and you're in there for a good 20 minutes. Mm. just baking and so definitely my stamina and my overall strength I've had to train probably three times a week on average that I'll train something and I've seen the results definitely you see my some other competitors who don't do the same be struggling as a race continues on mm. whereas myself and definitely other do you see the competitive but competitive guys usually doing the same thing they all all of us work out and do our own thing on the side Definitely, it's a rigorous program to put yourself on that. I mean, especially when you're just starting the, the term, the discipline that you need to mm -hmm. stick to it and 
to actually see any results is insane mm -hmm. and it goes the same for any sport right i mean if you're if you're if you're a track star you, you have to go out there and train almost every day of your life to see those results and to drop that tenth of a second and i definitely mm -hmm. say it's the same for racing but you have been racing for, for such a long time. How were you able to balance school and all of this? Well, I mean, uh, for school, <laughs> school, I definitely say that was down to my mom and dad. I mean, the, the agreement that we made when I was about, I think it was seven, that okay. to, to race, for me to race, I had to get straight A's. And oh. since, we made, since I made that promise, I've been fairly successful. I mean, I might, might have got one or two B's throughout the years, but... <laughs> Definitely, I've tried my best to, to maintain that just so I could race. I mean, that was the agreement from the start, and okay. I stuck to it. Um, so what kind of car do you race now? So currently for circuit, I race a mm -hmm. uh, Honda Civic uh, EK9. It's, a mm -hmm. 19, it's actually pretty old. It's a 1998. And for any other car, car people out there, it has a B18C, and we've done everything to it i mean mm -hmm. the engine is fully built the car is fully stripped out roll cage proper race car mm -hmm. and for rally i have a um, 1989 corolla fx which is okay. has a 4ag 20 valve black top which mm -hmm. is also fully built itself and the car is fully gutted caged and we have intercom with radios in there and everything so both two proper race cars and we're actually selling the rally car if anyone is interested <laughs> but okay but both two two great cars and I, I love them i've been very successful in them so far mm -hmm. but when it comes to cars though um tommy um you can just use any car and and as we jamaicans would say swoop it up or what i mean <laughs> special for, cars that you have to use yeah so for a circuit it's a little harder because you have certain cars out there like the civic if you go to Dover, you'll see uh, probably 20 Civics in the field. Oh. And it's just because the platform was developed by Honda back then, specifically for racing. Oh. Usually manufacturers will come out with a, a model of car that is developed just for their, their factory racing team. And then everyone, all the regular people, so to say, would buy those cars and soup it up, as you'd say. Mm. But I mean, there's you can do a lot with certain cars, but to get them to the level that they need to be most of the time is very hard and very expensive mm -hmm. rather than going with something that has already been done and being competitive with that. Mm -hmm. But for Dover, so we have multiple classes. We have Super Street, which is a streetcar class. So any any streetcar, we actually have a pro box racing in there right now. Really? And they're doing pretty well. I mean, anyone can enter Super Street and have a fun and do well because it's a bracket class, one minute 45 for the track. Mm -hmm. which for some cars is hard for some cars is easier so it kind of evens up the field and you're racing out there with i think six people currently six to ten other people out there with their road cars mm -hmm. having fun doing all of you doing your best and enjoying yourself and just developing the skills to then move up into the ip class which is improved mm -hmm. production mm -hmm. so those are basically road cars with with the, when it's starting to be, become a race car it has a roll cage and it's been gutted out all the seats are out the engine has a little bit of work done to it so they're definitely a lot faster than the street car now mm. and after after you've done your work to that then you'll move up and you develop more your driver skill really and truly it's a driver skill that develops throughout the years along with the car both you have to progress together and become one gel to be one mm -hmm. and then you you move up to the mp class which is what i race in and that is complete fully purpose not purpose built, but complete race cars there's there's really no going back after that <laughs> and for those cars <laughs> but and for the last class we have thunder sport which is purpose-built race cars those have the cars from europe and america where they're built specifically for racing and nothing else okay but but is it an expensive sport because it seemed like you don't need mechanic you don't need all I the mean, <laughs> tires and all i have that. to say yes it is it is <laughs> definitely very expensive but mm -hmm. um, honestly like anyone can start in super street with their own road car mm -hmm. and from then once you make a, a name for yourself in super the main thing is making a name for yourself in super street okay. and ip and becoming a known driver and mm -hmm. at that point you can go to different people even you can go to family members at the start ask them each for like a five grand for the weekend Mm -hmm. put their brand or their company or whatever they'd want on the car to promote it yeah. 
Mm-hmm. That's what that's actually how my dad started when he was 27. He went to everyone he knew, asked them for about five grand. Mm-hmm. And want the money adds up and then you, you can afford to race at that point, especially if you don't have the initial cash. Mm-hmm. You can go out there and do what you need to do. And mm-hmm. as you progress through the ranks and become more known, then you can approach bigger companies like myself with Amsoil and Spanish Court Hotel and ATL. Mm-hmm. ATL Automotive actually sponsors me now, Rainforest Seafoods, Sherwin Williams Paint, I mean, Boomerang Tiles. All those guys oh, help me out tremendously throughout our race mm-hmm. weekend. So without sponsors, it's definitely not possible, or I don't think it's possible to reach any any other level of racing. But initially, it is quite easy to get into it and start mm-hmm. for yourself in a street, in the streetcar class, making a name for yourself and going out there and just having fun, really. At the end of the day, that's what it is, especially in Jamaica. Mm-hmm. Um, are, are you a fast driver in your private life as well? <laughs> I mean, occasionally, I, okay. as my, my dad had told me when I was younger, he, he, he'd said, I'm not going to tell you not to drive fast, but yeah. you, you have to know when the time is right. You have to observe what's going on around you. Obviously, if, you, if you're on the highway and you see every corner you're booking up lines of traffic, it, it doesn't make sense to take that risk. It's all about risk management. Mm-hmm. won't say I don't drive fast, but I won't <laughs> say everywhere I go, I'm flat, on, yeah. flat out going there. <laughs> Really, I mean, we actually have the the motto "race at Dover," the saying "race at Dover, not on the road." So, oh, okay. if you want, if you're really itching to get that out of your system, go to Dover. I think it's five thousand or ten thousand for the day to go to the track, mm-hmm. and go and drive your heart out. Obviously, make sure you maintain your car before you change your brake pads, your tires, so you don't end up worse off than when you went. But go out there, look at the track, feel it out, and just have a fun time. I mean, just enjoy it yourself. And that's what at the end of the day, that's what it is. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, what about accidents though, Tommy? Have you ever had um accidents on the track? Yes, I have. I've had in karting, I've had multiple, I mean mm-hmm. countless. I everyone's out there, we're, we're millimeters away from each other, millimeters away from the ground. So I mean honestly, it's it's a part of racing. Mm-hmm. And when you're when you're at the top, it's everyone wants the same thing, everyone wants to win. Everyone Obviously, every everyone out there has that same goal, and if they don't have that same goal, they're obviously not they're not aiming on the right thing. Especially when you're trying to make a name for yourself, and you're trying to build up that name as you go on. Mm-hmm. But so, so everyone has the same goal after that, though. How you bounce back? After? It's really honestly, it's a mental thing. So even well, 2019 October 2019, I started my first time at Dover Raceway, and I had an accident in the final race and. Like the worst thing was that COVID had happened and we didn't have any more circuit racing that I could go out and prove myself. But I knew in myself when I went back out there again, I'd be a better driver and be more experienced, especially Mm -hmm. throughout COVID. We made an effort to go out there and practice as much as we could, whenever we could, whenever we could get the sponsorship to go. We'd say, all right, let's go make a video with 876 Streets. Let's go promote the sponsors, get the rust off, get back into the groove, perfect some more corners. So when we did come back, end up coming back Easter Monday, I was ready and definitely took it to them as best as I could. Okay. Um, so who are some of the race car drivers that um, you look up to? I mean, currently I'd have to say my dad. Yeah, for definitely. Sure. I mean, from when I was little. <laughs> yes. And uh, I feel like I'd get in trouble if I didn't say that yes. one. But <laughs> other than him, I'd have to say David Somerville is one of them for sure. And probably Jeffrey Panton for rally as well. But that, I'd say that'd be my top three. My dad, David Sonbell, Jeffrey Panton. Mm-hmm. And like that, that influenced how I observe racing and how I anticipate it now. But there's also hundreds of, well, not hundreds, but probably a hundred names out there that you could call. Mm-hmm. Chris Isso, well, currently Kyle Gregg, William Myers, Senna Sonbell, David Sonbell's son. I'm very good friends with him. Mm. And the two of us came up through the ranks together from from I was five and he was probably eight. We were both in carts mm. okay. racing against each other, becoming best friends. Mm-hmm. And throughout the years, you build those relationships. You lose some along the way with the battles that you have, mm-hmm. but it, it's all of a part of it. And I think there's a huge community that follows racing in Jamaica. And I think 
all of them have seen it throughout the years and I'm pretty sure there's a lot more to come. Mm-hmm. So what has been your most um, memorable experience in car racing so far? I definitely have to say uh, winning the, my first race at Dover. Mm. It was an intense battle with Nick Barnes. And after that, I, I came and I collected the checkered flag by corner three. And just to see the whole crowd there cheering <laughs> me on, it was, it was amazing. It's something that you can't, it's hard to explain. It's indescribable. <laughs> and even when you come into the pits and the crowd is right by the pits, everyone taking pictures, <laughs> yes. hugging up family and friends. So it's amazing. It's, it's indescribable and it's <laughs> a high. It's a high of the weekend for sure. It's what keeps you coming back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so talk about that, um, that adrenaline rush, though. Tell us about that, because drivers seem to talk a lot about that. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> something I, I'm pretty certain that we all experience. I mean, mm-hmm. you're on, especially you make your way out of the pits onto the grid and you're there and all the tension is building. You're looking around, you're observing who's beside you, who's behind you, who's to your left, to your right. And you're, you're thinking about all the scenarios in your head and your heart just keeps on racing and racing and racing. <laughs> uh, every, you, you feel everything just coming on happy at that one moment. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you press the start button and you go off and you're doing your warm-up lap, that's when everything really <laughs> sets in. And yeah. just before the green flag drops, I'd have to say, you're almost shaking with adrenaline. I mean, especially after, like during the race, it, it kind of fades away. So definitely when you're, when you're in the battle with someone and as you finish that last move and you come across the line, everything, it, it just, it's like a relief. Yes. And, <laughs> and the, just the happiness that is released in you. Uh, in just, just because, not even just driving the car alone gives, gives me happiness at least, but mm-hmm. winning a race and meeting that, that one person that you set out to meet, that you have some kind of beef with or attention with throughout the weekend and meeting them. And coming into the pits and seeing all the crew happy, everyone happy around it, it just, it's amazing. It's something like a once in a lifetime experience, I'd have to say. But mm. obviously, I hope to have it win many more. But it's something that it's hard to describe to just a normal person who hasn't experienced it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You, mentioned, you mentioned mental toughness before. But what are, to be a successful race car driver, what are the other attributes that someone would should have so obviously as men, as you said mental toughness i mean be able to being able to bounce back from any any and every situation i mean if you have a spin in the first lap of qualifying when you're mm-hmm. trying to set your grid position you have to be able to come out of that mm-hmm. do another cool down lap get everything back in back set in place and go out there and do your best again right immediately right after you can have that in, your, in the back of your mind or else you're not going to be driving at 100%. Mm. And I'd have to say being fearless as well. I mean, if, you, if you're overthinking every little thing that's happening in the car, you, you're never going to be able to unlock that potential that it has. Mm. And finally, I'd have to say, like, probably the, the most important one is being, like, ruthless with how you're, you're thinking about it. You can't say, oh, just because he's my friend, I'm not going to pass him. I let him get this <laughs> win or... You have yes. you have to have that that cold blooded feeling mm-hmm. every every move you're making. Obviously, you have that thing in the back of your mind with your safety and mm-hmm. all of that is going on with you. But just to be able to dive in and make that move on the inside or the outside of the purse, I mean, it's mm-hmm. definitely one of the, the key attributes of a racing driver. Mm-hmm. All right, you go off to university. Um, how will you um, continue to maintain this? um driving um career so i plan to i structured my classes in a way where i have fridays off and i have only one class on late enough on a monday so i will i plan to fly back on the, the fridays before events uh, like the next one well i go the next one is august 14th I hope to see you there. You should come. I hope to see yes, you there. Yes, I definitely, I definitely, I'm going to be there, Tommy. I have to be there to see yeah, you. I'll make sure. <laughs> yeah. And then after I go away to university after that, mm-hmm. and the next one is October Heroes Weekend mm-hmm. in October. So I, I plan to fly down that weekend, compete, and fly directly back up, and obviously go back to school. I mean, school is a priority, mm-hmm. but obviously I'd love to race whenever I can. So 
the plan is to structure it around school and if i can i make it if i can't i won't unfortunately but mm. definitely the plan is to come back and race at every opportunity okay um so how do you see your future as a race car driver so currently in the caribbean i'd like to or in jamaica i'd like to compete in the higher classes probably maybe in a year or two with mm-hmm. Senna Sonobel in like Thunder Sport with the prototype cars. And also in the car- to compete in the Caribbean and internationally as my dad did, would be amazing. And to win the Caribbean championships as well. And if I, while I'm at university, I'm going to explore the options of racing in the States. I mean, obviously it's much more expensive. So it's just to find the right opportunity. I know I can go out there and prove myself and I know I have the, the ability to do it. Mm-hmm. So I need to find the right opportunity, make the right connections and, hopefully you'll see me up there racing at some point but if not i plan to come back and definitely continue to compete in jamaica and the caribbean Mm -hmm. what advice do you have to leave for young people who might want to try an unconventional career then but you know is hesitant based on you know what persons might be saying or i mean obviously you'll have the naysayers anyone usually it's not even that they're they're thinking of the best for you is usually they're jealous of what you're about to embark on. So I'd have to say, even if any type of career, just keep your mind to it, do all the work that you need to do. You have to put in the extra hours. You can't do the regular nine to five. You you have to put in the extra hours, do the research, watch, watch back the tapes. If it's an athlete, watch back your tapes, look where you can find that extra 10th or millisecond, because in the end, that's really what counts. You have the ones that's doing the extra work do the proper research and be, be efficient with it. I mean, don't throw away your social life or anything like that. You have to have a balance. So even I'm racing the whole of next weekend, the Monday and Tuesday, I'm going to recover, get back on top of my schoolwork. Then the Wednesday, maybe I'll go out with a friend or two and relax again. You can't keep that tension on you the whole time. It's impossible to sustain it. So you just keep hard working, be disciplined and have a proper schedule but also be able to relax with your, your friends every once in a while and take it all back, take a step back and look at what you're doing and think about it truthfully in yourself and see if it's possible, if it's feasible. Mm-hmm. And if it is, then go for it for sure. Put your all into it. Well, thank you again, Tommy. It was great talking and to you. Thank you for having me. Yes. I'm hope, just... I hope to see you there August 14th. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm going to be there, Tommy. I'm going to be there. <laughs>